All right, so today is uh, Thursday, August 23rd, 2012. Could be the end of the world any day, right? 2012. <laughs> oh, no, well, wait. Uh, the Mayan uh, New Year was July the 26th, so I guess we made it. We made it? Yeah, I just realized we made it. So uh, all you that are living on a hill, you know, that have sold all your goods like the Thessalonians back in the biblical times, uh, best go get a job again. <laughs> so anyway, I'm here with uh, Sherry Strong today, and um, I realized here a, a few weeks ago that I know a lot of just um, wicked cool and wicked smart people, and I don't know if I should say wicked or not, um, um, really cool, really smart people, and I thought it'd be in, uh interesting to or useful to introduce uh, all these people to my tribe and uh, so Sherry if people would like to get in touch with you what's the best way for them to connect with you uh, I think probably the easiest is Sherry at SherryStrong.com so cool. just like a strong Sherry reversed there so you go right. yeah and so um, yeah if you um, um, like to connect with Sherry to get on her list and keep up with her projects girl you got to start a meetup group Okay. Yeah, you got got to do that so people can uh, stay hooked up with you easy. And uh, also, you know, if you've got a, uh, you speak uh, about health topics, and do you speak to groups about other topics also, or? It's really I'm I'm, in some respects a generalist, so I really approach things from a holistic perspective. Uh, and my background is as a chef and nutritionist. Cool. And I've been branding myself as a food philosopher for the last twelve years. And because um, basically I, I take very much a philosophical approach to many things cool. around the holistic way of living. Yeah. Good. So um, uh, you could speak to even entrepreneur groups and things like that? Absolutely. So in Australia, uh, the people that uh, I was hired to speak for mostly were uh, corporate groups, entrepreneurial groups, business people. Really, because uh, one of the topics I used to speak on was better body, better brain, better business. Ah, cool. That's yeah. kind of the the uh, tagline I use with wetware hacking. You know, un uh, unauthorized overclocking of your body, brain, and being. <laughs> yeah. Cool. That's it. Yeah. So you said Australia. So you were in Australia. First off, you were, you started in Canada, right? Yes. So and, and I I to... started my career learning everything bad about food in Canada. Awesome. Yeah. And um, not that that's a reflection on Canada, because as you know, you can learn that in any country oh, nowadays. Yeah. yeah. And uh, then I went to Australia and experienced probably, you know, kind of the the threshold or, you know, that, that place where you just have had enough. And um, I got sick enough and felt horrible enough and fat enough. Oh, I started to make some changes. Cool. Well, you're in um, you were in Australia a long time, right? Twenty two years. So at that point, it was half my life when I left. Yeah. And what what was the remind me of the city you were living in Australia? Melbourne. Melbourne, right? Yeah. yeah. We got a uh, we got a lot of uh, a lot of folk down under that uh, will yes. probably watch this that are also here in the states and spread through um, Canada and all sorts of places. So. Good. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, um, well, so you told you said a little bit about your story. You said you got like a, like Joe Cross, uh, fat, sick, and nearly dead. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, what was the kind of the precipitating, um, um, I don't know, event or collection of events that got you uh, off the bad track onto the straight and narrow? Yeah, you know, I think uh, people often like to have, you know, one of those terrible epiphanal kind of events. And I think for me, it was just reaching that threshold of just this is enough. Like, I would roll over in bed, in, in bed you know, my stomach would follow, that kind of thing. And, oh. and it was just, you know, I'd, I would wake up in the morning and try and put on clothes and go, you know, this is not the body I'm meant to be living in. It's just, it's not the body. I'm not meant to feel this way. I'm not and to feel depressed, sad, and angry all the time. Oh, yeah. And I really believe that, you know, there's kind of a, a twofold thing. It's not just the food we eat, it's the thoughts we think. And so, really, the journey I set out on was twofold. I had to actually not just clean up what I was eating, because I was completely addicted, completely addicted to sugar. Like, Congratulations. Like addict. 
Pardon me? Congratulations, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I had to clean up the food side, but I, I knew that it was the thoughts that I was thinking that was creating the feelings that I had that, you know, moved me and motivated me to choose certain foods. So it became a dual yeah. journey of, of cleaning both sides up. Yeah, a lot of people, especially in Western culture, we have this weird um, differentiation between um, uh, our um, our physicality and feelings and mentation and spiritual center. And you know, I got news: uh, it, we're all you know multidimensional beings, and we're all hooked up together. And so, you know, everything you um, ingest whether it's a, a, a thought or concept or, you know watching the nightly news reading a newspaper yes. reading a book listening to whatever or yes. down to what you eat drink and breathe um, everything goes together to make us uh, who and what we are absolutely and so if you know I, I when I'm uh, teaching workshops I, I tell people you know if you'd like to have different you got to do different you know, a lot of people suffer from what I call secretitis, you know, where you th they think they're going to ponder their navel and somehow be spiritual enough that all, all great bounty will precipitate around them with no activity. And, uh, you know, that ain't the way it works here in 3D reality. You have to align your, your thought, word, and deed with whatever your desired outcome is. And, Absolutely. you know, you got to take action. Absolutely. <clears throat> it's interesting yeah. to me a lot of... Uh, a lot of um, uh, spiritual teachers or healers uh, that I've had contact with over the years have died from uh, things like cancer, mm -hmm. and, and it's because of what they're putting in their mouth. And I hear, you know, I hear this rhetoric of, uh, "Well, I can transmute whatever I put in my mouth with love, and it'll be the." Gr you know, I got news. Something's out of kilter if you're eating, you know, mystery cadaver and you're supposed to be a spiritual person. You know, if you're eating death, um, you know, the, what's going to precipitate in your body is death. So, I don't know. Maybe that, maybe that's too much too soon for some people, and that's too bad. <laughs> and, and you know what? Uh, it, it is a journey for people. So, they work on one side of their life, oh. and, and then sometimes they, you know, they have to get that fixed or... Or at a place where they're comfortable at it before they can even look at the other side of their life. Well, what's a really good idea for people too is to to connect with um, other tribes of people. You know, whether it's you know connecting with us uh, in you know here in Austin or different things we do around the world, or you, or or you know connect with people that have you know that kind of renaissance facility or, or vibe in their life where they've uh, they're all about balancing. Uh, all their different uh, areas of their life simultaneously because it's a big difference. I mean, I, I find that I, I much prefer to be around people that are focused on um, enhancing their consciousness and their nutrition simultaneously than, yeah. you know, somebody that's uh, eating mystery cadaver and, you know, oming, you know, meditating for eight hours a day. I, that, that, that person just doesn't uh, turn me on at all. I, and what you'll find, what what I observe a lot of with that is, you get the kind of the the zeal of the newly converted, mm -hmm. or you know the extremism. So when they're just so delving into one side, right, um, that's where you often get the people who are fanatical about it and judgmental. And I think that's probably the in the whole health world, the thing that is probably the biggest obstruction to people changing yeah. is that judgmentalness. I find it just as toxic as, you know, as processed food. Yeah, I, I, I agree a hundred percent with that. Now, what yeah. I tell people is, you know, independent of what you're eating, even if it is mystery cadaver or, you know, uh, whatever you're eating, whatever you're eating is the right thing for you to be eaten. Now, there's also an upgrade path from every place, you know, everyone has an upgrade path. And so my, what I tell people is if they have a strong craving for something, just eat it. But what does it matter? You've been eating it for years anyway. Just eat it again and then take, you know, kind of once you've satisfied that strong craving, then take a step back and say, well, what was it in that thing that was um, uh, creating my desire? We use subtractive uh, craving decoding, too. Like if somebody has a craving for a hamburger, well, OK, if you took the bun away, would you still find it, you know, attractive? And if it's yes, well, if you took the tim pickles away or whatever. And so um, it's interesting to do subtractive craving decoding and find, uh, like I used to crave, um, uh, I don't know if you know what Owen's Country Sausage is, 
Uh, probably not. Anyway, it's a it's a, a brand of sausage here that's manufactured in the U.S. And it, it's the only place you can get really high levels of uh, black pepper and sage. Oh. So, you know, if you look at things like that, like, for example, if you took, you know, the black pepper and sage out of the Owens Country Sausage, would you have any desire for it? Probably not, because it'd be absolutely tasteless. So a lot of times uh, what people are craving are actually mediums for um, uh, very nutrient-dense uh, spices, mm. like sage or pepper or... Um, uh, uh, cinnamon a lot of times in sweet dishes so uh, yeah. yeah what uh, wherever a person is you're you're always the right place right and if anybody tells you oh you're evil or bad no 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 no, no. you better do a 180 and run right right <laughs> I mean I get that all the time <laughs> cool well so what's your um, <clears throat> what's your uh, what's your big project right now oh well I just released um, an ebook called seven recipes for life Cool. So that's um, just gone live this week, and um, getting some lovely feedback on that, so which is really cool. And um, so that that premise is based on that literally, most people prepare no more than seven recipes throughout their their week. They just do variations on it. Mm. And what I've done is I've come up with seven recipes that if anyone is actually you know kind of struggling on that journey and really wants to to lose weight naturally and healthily without dieting mm -hmm. if you just start to incorporate these seven recipes into your life you're going to start to hyper nourish your body cool yeah. Ooh, and, i like that term hyper nourish Ooh, I like that. <laughs> I'm, you know i'm going to take that one hyper nourish oh that's good just 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 as uh just so we've got it on camera that um <laughs> My ego says thank you very much. Oh, absolutely! I, I always ascribe uh, uh, different. Yeah. Uh, so yes. Yeah, so stuff. hyper nourishment is what I have learned um, through my studies and through working with people is when you can start to hyper nourish them, that their cravings for the toxic things tend to lessen and dissipate. As there was a great study that was done, I believe at Loma, Loma Linda University with with rats, where they um, gave them a choice between alcohol and water. And when they were nourished, they chose water. And when they were malnourished, they chose alcohol. So, um, and what I've noticed with people is when you start to really super and hyper nourish them, that they're, you know, they start to feel better. And so often our, our choices in food are really a reflection of us not feeling so good. So we might, yeah. we might choose foods based on, you know, their flavors and, and things like that. But I believe, the processed diet really has us selecting food based on the drug-like reactions from the processing that actually happens with the food. Well, you, you, and you, so, sort of, you sort of bring up a really interesting thing, too, about uh, the rats with the alcohol and water, too, is a lot of people, and this kind of goes back to judging, too. A lot of people, mm -hmm. for example, especially uh, alcoholics or um, people that are addicted to either street drugs or pharmaceuticals, which, by the way, there was a study done and over the, the 90s, um, the study showed that uh, street drug use went up 30 percent, addiction to street drugs um, and addiction to pharmaceuticals, doctor prescribed drugs, uh, addiction went up 300 percent, an order of magnitude. So it's yeah. way better to go to your local street corner pusher than a doctor. Um, you'll probably, <laughs> there's less chance of being addictive. Um, right. Alcohol is a really good case, though, because yeah. you know, another reason that people eat is because they, you know, if they're eating processed foods or they make the mistake of going in a grocery store and they think that they're going to find food there, that's a big problem, right? You walk in Black Hole Foods and you see all these lines of stuff on the wall and you think, oh, it's a grocery store. This must be food. No, no it's, all, it's all drugs. And um, yeah. if you take those drugs long enough, you're, you'll lose the ability to metabolize real food. Then yes. it gets really interesting. So this is why AA is a, you know, it's just a crock. It's ridiculous uh, in most cases is that there, AA and NA, all these different uh, anonymous groups are trying to move a physiological boulder with an emotional or spiritual le lever. And mm -hmm. if a person's lost the ability to metabolize sugar, they can no longer break down produce or carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates into sugar. They got to have alcohol to live. Mm -hmm. Ain't no way to stop drinking alcohol if you die, if you're going to die without it. And the other thing is when you're eating food too, a lot of people miss the the um, 
the different large food components like water and heat. Mm. So for, I mean, one of the reasons people have uh, such a hard time um, uh, getting off cooked food and processed food is that they have to have that. It's the only, for example, heat they get. Or they'll, they're drinking too little water and their body will then try to eat food to get water, which is a really bad idea. So, you know, it's really complicated. The best best approach is, um, you know, like you said, hyper hyper nourish and I say hyper hydrate too. And it's not really, it's funny t- saying hyper nourishment and hyper hydration because really all you're saying is you ought to eat the way you ought to eat and we ought to drink the way we ought to drink. Mm. And it's funny that now we're, we're talking about hyperhydration and hypernourishment when really that's what we're supposed to be doing is eating nutrient-dense, calorie-sparse food. So that's right. It, we have come a long way <laughs> out yes. of balance. Absolutely, yeah. So what's, and, the, what's the best way to, for a person to, uh, if, if you were, like you, you said, you, what was your top weight when you were uh, overweight? You know, I don't know the actual, it was one of those things that uh, I I have never owned a scale. So oh. scales were always really scary to me. I bore other people so at a period of time. But um, I do know that I had a pair of pants that I can fit into one leg of them right now. Wow. I was a size 16. I'm now anywhere from American sizing four to six. Um, yeah, so. I dropped a lot of sizes of clothing. So how did you start um, uh, getting into the the um, uh, the groove of upgrading your uh, eating into, you know, from what you were into more of a hyper nourishment sort of state of eating? What was your sort of process that you went through to retrain? I have to say, David, that um, in many respects, I'm a slow learner. <laughs> But, you know, it took a long time. I, the weight initially came off because I started running huh. because I just knew that I was too addicted to food that I couldn't give that up. Cool. But the interesting thing that happened is as I started to run, as my body started to clean out and I got healthier, you know, because that, that's one piece of the puzzle, I started to crave better foods. Interesting. And at that time, I was actually involved. I was the Victorian Chair of Nutrition Australia. So I had, you know, these ties to the nutrition world. And I went back to start studying at Deakin University. And I started to realize how corrupt the nutrition industry was. Oh, yeah. And uh, and so I I started to ask questions from my lecturers that really decided, you know, because I remember as a chef, I read Harold McGee's, you know, on food and cooking, um, his book about an understanding about how sugar was made. And I would ask my lecturers, well, what's the difference between refined sugar and pure raw honey? And, um, you know, the lecturer said, they're the same thing, Sherry, you know, sucrose is sucrose, sugar is sugar. And I'm like thinking that can't, it doesn't make sense because I know how this is made. It doesn't make sense that it would actually have the same effect on the body. Um, and so I started to, you know, really delve really into the, the study of how these things were actually processed and made. And what I found out was there was this common denominator between all processed foods. It's what I call the lethal recipe. And I really refer to, it's five main ingredients, but really there's many, as you would know, of these ingredients that in the supermarket, if you were to take these five things out of food, <laughs> you have no food. barely have anything left on the shelf, right? Okay. And that these five things are processed very, very similar to how we actually take opium sap, which and in make, its natural state is not toxic, and addictive, right? And then we take it through all these um, steps and stages of processing to remove the macro and micronutrients, use heat to denature it, right? Yeah. Um, and then keep extracting, extracting, extracting until you're in that with this white, clear, yeah. addictive, toxic substance. It's interesting that sugar is 99.99% pure. That's better than the best cocaine or heroin you can get. That's right. And Scripps Institute and Rodale Institute have, you know, through studies have confirmed that it's as addictive as cocaine and heroin. Oh, yeah. So, and I believe that um, sugars, refined sugars, refined oils, refined salts, refined grains and chemicals, which I call this lethal recipe and, you know, you know, soy and dairy go in there as well, kind of the addendum uh, to that. But when we, when we put anything through those processes, they become highly addictive, addictive and toxic to the body. 
And so really the antidote is to um, obviously remove those things, mm -hmm. but often, you know, people are so addicted, <laughs> it's like you're taking my drugs away. Oh, know? yeah. It becomes very confronting for people. And so I don't think there's a, you know, one-stop cookie cutter approach for people. I think based on your physiology, the way, you know, you look at the world, your past you know, experience in life, it colors the way you actually do life. And so I think, I, I guess that's why I think the seven recipes for life is so um, helpful is because it's not saying to people, cut everything out overnight, you know, go to go cold turkey, go into a detox center or whatever. Oh, yeah, that's a really bad idea. Also, it's a really yeah. bad idea. If you're listening to this, make sure if you're under a physician's care and you're taking some kind of scripts, especially if you're taking like 30 or 40 of them, for oh. God's sake, do not stop taking those. Yeah. You you may end up in a world of hurt. If you're going to detox off chemicals, the best way to do it is one at a time and probably not with your doctor, but with a compounding pharmacist in your area. Because compounding pharmacists, people that actually, you know, they take the stuff and compound it together that with a mortar and pestle is where the name came from back in the old days. They know more about drug interactions and herb interactions than any doctor could ever possibly know. So if you'd like to get off a bunch of drugs, you take all the stuff to your compounding pharmacist and say, what's the easiest one to get off first? And you do them one at a time. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And and I go into the kitchen and I work with the replace principle. So, mm. you know, a lot of people aren't willing to give up certain things. But what they are willing to do is to replace it with something that is going to be more nourishing, less toxic. And taste so, similar, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and you just work, work at that depending on what's available in your, your local area. Cool. So, yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Um, if you look at Sherry's recipes and a lot of uh, like Yamaya's recipes and other raw food chefs, you'll notice the sort of a common philosophy is that if you look at foods, they're made up of um, uh, textures and tastes. And so if you can duplicate a texture and taste using something far more upscale, you got a big win. A, a really simple one is um, uh, pasta because that stuff is so heinous. Uh, that stuff is evil. I mean, if you, if you think about what pasta is, it's basically eating Elmer's glue. Uh, you know, you wouldn't get a bottle of Elmer's glue off the, the store and drink it. So why would you eat, you know, flour and water mixed together? So you can get these little spiralized. You, you probably know what a spiralizer is, right? The little spiralized yeah. thing. And you can, you can make uh, Capelli or Angel Heart pasta out of, um, uh, you know. Cheesy zucchini or we use what we do is zucchini and multicolored squash so it comes out this really beautiful greens and oranges and yellows and it tastes just like pasta except it ain't elmer's glue yeah it's you're good gonna, for you i'm not gonna feel bad after eating it yeah. yeah yeah so there's there's really so many um things that we can do and i think probably the the thing that helped me the most was really understanding how nature works hmm. and there was so much noise around me, particularly, you know, coming from Nutrition Australia and, and all the kind of the people who were really threatened by the natural health movement. Oh, I bet. And I just thought there was, there was so much information out there. You get the clinical journal, the Asia Pacific Clinical Journal of Nutrition, and you would have all these studies in there and they would contradict one another. And then what, what I, came down to is, and what I found is, you know, because people are really, you know, you really have to have the science basis for what you're talking about. You know, you really have to have the scientific information. And what that came down to for me was what I observed is you can find a scientific study to back whatever lifestyle you want to justify. And in fact, many people who don't want to make changes in their life say, well, what's the science behind that? You know, <laughs> show me conclusive proof. You know what I, you know what I tell people? Uh, when they say that, um, what's the science behind what you know? Whatever you're telling, what I, what I, my response is, um, what you do is you look at a person's skin, you know, without any makeup or anything on it. And when I was 25, my I looked like a concentration camp victim uh, because my I'd lost my ability to digest and assimilate food, and I was so dehydrated that uh, my face was cracked and creviced. And it would, it was, uh, you know, the, the, it was, uh, I had really bad psoriasis and it was bleeding in the cracks in my face and hands and feet. 
uh, and I, I couldn't gain any weight to save my life. And so, you know, uh, my, the science for me is, all right, let's take, uh, you know, whatever doctor that has uh, an idea or some scientific data and we'll stand side by side and we'll look at his, their skin and my skin and we'll look at where they came from and I came from and we'll see, you know, who's got the best energy, who's got the best cognitive facility. And, you know, if you'd like to, if you'd like to look like one of these, you know, bald, scruffy, uh, half cadaver doctor scientists, then you should, you know, follow their data. Mm -hmm. If you'd like to, you know, have a vibrant, radiant, uh, uh, charismatic sort of bio biology, then you find somebody that's got that and you just say, what do you do? And, you, you know, you just do what they do. Yeah. Like, you know, I'd much rather look like you than yeah, most of the the uh, scientists that I've met that have, you know, the data. Ooh, yeah. the data. Weird science. Beware. Yes. And, and consistently, that's what you'll find out in the areas that when people don't want to make changes, they hide behind the science. And mm -hmm. if you if you were dependent on science to make food choices, well, you know, it's only recently that they're actually starting to do the research to show how bad these highly refined oils that are made with, you know, they're processed with, with gasoline, you know, heptane and hexane and, oh, yeah, um, hexane, yeah. you know, hydrochloric acid and um, really nasty, nasty chemicals, you know, <laughs> like just to give you an example, many people in the, the so-called kind of hippie movement in the 70s knew that these oils weren't good for you even before they even had full understanding of how they were oh, processed yeah. and made, right? Because their bodies were clean and natural. And when you, when your body's clean, you know, and, it, and it's, it's not toxic, as soon as it even touches your lips, you know whether something's good for you or not. A lot of times, even whether you can, uh, you know, when it passes your lips or when you smell it or even when you hold it. You I've hold it, yes. Yeah, as time goes by and uh, a person comes upscale in their uh, consciousness and their their uh, biological intelligence reboots at such a high level that, um, you know, at a quantum level, you know, we used to call it magic, right? Now we call it quantum mechanics. Quantum mm -hmm. mechanics says hey, everything's connected, which ain't <laughs> rocket science. People have been saying that forever, right? Yeah. And that's the whole basis of, the, of uh, all forms of mysticism is that everything's connected. And so yeah. everything's connected. If you, if your consciousness comes up scale to a certain point, you can look at something and say, mm -mm. or you can pick it up and say, uh, -uh. or you can smell it or eat it. That's right. And so, you know, my suggestion is, um, you know, and you said something sort of in passing that I think is, um, really important is that people, anytime people, uh, something comes out of a person's mouth that is about, you know, where's your science or where's your data? I, I, think that you hit it right on the head is people that, that sort of uh, say that are in a confrontational mode because they um, are resistant to change in their, in their yeah. own life. Like, yeah. a, like the, a guy that I know was uh, railing at me about how bad agave nectar was while he's uh, got a beer in one hand and a cigarette in the other. And I'm like, dude, that is freaking <laughs> confused thinking, right? You know, yeah. you, 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 you know, the least of your problems is a little bit of agave nectar if you're smoking yeah. and, and boozing. So yeah, and no doubt, probably had a big belly. You know. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, to <laughs> you know, but bigger than it should have been. Yeah. 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 So. So and and that's you know it's really natural. I, I look I look at them as our kind of our soothers. You know, we have such wounded backgrounds. You know, we we hold on to these things. Because, you know, we haven't learned the ways to actually soothe ourselves through our, through our thoughts that then, you know, create the feelings that make us feel good. And for many years, you know, I was there and um, I would start off the day with half a liter of Sara Lee Ultra Chocolate Ice Cream, you know. Ooh. Not stop. I know. You're thinking, how did you stop at half a liter? Right. Yeah. Awesome. Pure control, I used to Dave. do the same thing. It was haagen for me, though. <laughs> yeah. You know, and when, as Maya Angelou says, when you know better, you do better. So it's it's a process of, of actually knowing better. And often, here's the thing, people are so toxic that their kinesthetic abilities that actually distinct, help them, you know, decide whether something's good for them or not, it's gone. You know, they don't know how to trust nature anymore because they're so completely disconnected from it. Well, and so, you brought up another point too. Besides being uh, kinesthetically disconnected, is when a person is toxic and they 
um, begin to come up scale in some way, yeah, there's a lot of inertia that they have to, um, you know, kind of butt against, and that inertia might be from a microbial microbial intelligences that have set up in their bodies. So you know, if yes. your if your body is very toxic, then that's a you know a, a breeding ground for all sorts of bacteria and fungus and parasites. Uh, and also, um, if you've got uh, chemical dependencies developed, whether it's uh, something as simple as alcohol or uh, sugar, which is you know about the same thing, or it's all the way to you know oxy or heroin. If you mm -hmm. stop taking your fix, then you know, it's going to hurt. Yeah. So here's what here's what we do uh, in in our with our clients is that, and that's the reason we started packaging chocolate bliss is that I figured out long ago, is it, it the way that all these different substances work in our bodies is they hijack different metabolic passage uh, passageways or pathways. For example, like. Uh, nicotine. Uh, nicotine hijacks the dopamine uh, mm -hmm. metabolic pathway. And so if you smoke and you stop, you can no longer produce dopamine and you will feel awful. I mean, it ain't like some sort of conceptional, oh, I feel blue today. No, 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 no. It's you feel awful. You hurt. Yeah. And the same way with heroin. It's, you know, you stop taking heroin after you've been doing it for a while and it hurts. Yeah. And so um, the way that you can, um, um, you know, dramatically um, reduce the pain associated with detox is if you flood your body with um, uh, nutrients that can hijack back the, all these different pathways. So that means lots of, you know, what you're talking about, hyperhydration um, or hypernourishment, hyperhydration, and also flooding your body full of uh, chemicals that build neurotransmitters and hormones. So things like uh, chocolate and uh, uh, guarana, rhodiola, uh, any, anything that's a dense precursor to build all these chemicals. And you don't try to, you know, by willpower, stop doing, you know, something. Hey, go hijack <laughs> yourself back Yeah. with the good stuff. Yeah. There's, there's also a correlation, too, between, you know, um, you know, how we think and feel and the food we're attracted to. Mm -hmm. So if we actually want to be attracted to foods that vibrate at a higher level, we need to start thinking and feeling, you know, thoughts and emotions that vibrate on a higher level because they work yep. you know, in tandem. And sometimes, you know, you choose the food that helps you think the higher thought. Sometimes you have the higher thought that helps you choose the, you know, the higher vibrational food. And that's a good reason to hook up with a tribe of people that are at your level or above. If Absolutely. You're, if you're going Absolutely. to, you know, if you're hanging out at bars, you know, boozing with uh, losers and, you know, getting picked up and picking up losers every night and <laughs> flooding your brain with music and literature that is very downscale, you know, that's like yeah. the, yeah, you know, it's running with weights on. My suggestion yeah. is throw those weights off. And it, and if you think you, you're, you don't, you don't, I don't know where my tribe is. Well, just go on to meet up and search for different interests you have, which yeah. doesn't mean, you know, one night stand booze parties. Go, <laughs> go look for, you know, like if you're, um, you know, interested in health, look, uh, look under the raw food keyword or, or bacon. Uh, look up uh, uh, business, you know, what, whatever interests you, find a tribe of people that's upscale and hang around with them. Steer clear yeah. of all the losers and yeah. losers. <laughs> yeah. Joseph Campbell said it best, follow your bliss, right? Yeah. Yeah. So not just your chocolate bliss. Yeah, they, yeah follow your chocolate bliss. That's, that's good. <laughs> I like that. Good Joseph. He was on the payroll. <laughs> hey, there's a great movie I highly recommend called Finding Joe. Finding Joe. Wow. It's all about the hero's journey, and oh. um, yeah, you can get it. You can get it online, pay-per-view type thing. Um, brilliant movie. I, I show it to all my students. It's um, yeah, it's kind of required viewing. Have you seen May I Be Frank? No, I saw the trailers for it, but I haven't watched it. Yeah, Frank's a pretty cool guy. May I Be Frank and. Um... Have, you've met Joe Cross, right? He's an Aussie. He's he was there. In no, Mississippi. I haven't met him. Oh, okay. Um, I'll I'll have to give you an introduction, so maybe you can um, host him coming and speaking, um, uh, in your area there in Vancouver. Uh, Fat, sick, and nearly dead is another fantastic movie. Yeah. 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 So, and you know, they're really, they're all you know reflections. Not finding Joe so much, but those movies are really just people kind of from the drug addicted you know the 
the lethal recipe. They're, you know, people who've weaned themselves off the lethal recipe and really moved towards nature. And uh, one of the ways that I really help people understand what it is we're meant to be eating in nature is by getting them to observe the hierarchy of the nutrients that are available on the planet. Cool. And so based on bioavailability, what is most available on the planet? Mm. And and if you kind of look at it, there is this hierarchy, um, not just in what is available, but the effort that's required for humans to actually get it. So well, that, I, there's that's two a, things. That's a good point. So, so how would you translate that for people? Okay, so um, the nutrient we're most life dependent on, we can't survive seconds without, is what? Air. It's air. It's yeah. everywhere. Now, isn't it interesting that the nutrient we're most life dependent on, we don't have to wake up each morning and think, okay, where am I going to get my air today, yeah. right? Okay, so, and the second most abundant nutrient water. Uh, that we can't survive days without is water. Okay, so there is this hierarchy in nature, and, and so, um, and you can't get by in nature and get your water without movement, okay? Right. so air, water, movement, hmm. then we go to what is it, you know, as far as what's the major source of nutrients on the planet beyond air, water, and nutrient that we're life dependent on, it's vegetation, yeah. it's green, you know, and if you look at how much it covers the planet and where humans actually, the healthiest, you know, tribes of people were in yeah. the most air parts of the of the planet yeah right? it's interesting because the 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 you know we're, i mean we're primarily tropical critters i mean mm -hmm. we we ain't meant to live in the arctic circle right we're meant yeah. to live you know frolicking naked on the shores of the islands yes and it's interesting that the primary foods there are uh, both sweet and non-sweet fruits you know the things with seeds like you know the non-sweet fruits would be like peppers and tomatoes and coconuts and avocados cucumbers and the sweet fruits, of course, would be all the tropical fruits like, you know, mangoes and papayas There's, and durian and jackfruit. Um, and then also greens grow, you know, greens. in great abundance. So it's yeah. interesting that you can pick fruit and greens and they, they require, you know, you don't have to freaking cultivate mangoes and spinach in Hawaii. It freaking grows like weeds. Yeah. And yeah. same way with tomatoes. I, we stayed at one place years ago. And there was this feral tomato patch that, I mean, it was this huge tomato patch. It was just, you know, brambles of tomatoes growing on the ground. And so that, that's, that's interesting. I mean, if you think about it, um, things like, uh, you know, grains or even things like olives. I mean, you have to do a lot of work to process an olive to make it palatable to eat. That's right. Uh, I, I mean, you Whereas, can, most people don't just, realize that. If you just press it and you get the oil you can actually see that that might be a better use of the of the plant. Yeah, that's interesting. I, and you can do that by hand. So you yeah. can actually, the, well, with the stone, a stone, just yeah. like coconuts, you know, um, mm. you can get the oil from it. So if you think about it, there actually are more species of greens than, than fruits on the planet. So oh, yeah. greens, you know. So I look at it this way, that nature tells us to eat more green vegetation than fruits by the bioavailability um, thing, in, except there are very few places in the world where fruits, uh, fruit trees and plants bear fruit year round, right? Mm -hmm. um, usually, uh, and not only that, fruit has to grow to maturity and then ripen before it's palatable. And it's in the ripening process where most of the nutrients are actually infused into the plant. So it's nature's right. way of saying, eat a lot of this green stuff while this is, you know, coming to fruition. And, you know, so um, yeah. so there's, there's a, a bioavailability aspect to it. And, cool. you know, we live on a planet, but there isn't just one way of doing it. Um, you know, there are people who have lived in non-tropical areas. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if we, I look at the the aboriginals, um, you know, in Tasmania or um, the aboriginals here in Canada, uh, who this is definitely not tropical, <laughs> um, you know, if you, but Vancouver, this area is quite fertile as far as growing things. Oh, yeah. And that, you know, they did actually not just survive, but they thrived in certain areas mm -hmm. by eating in accordance to the context of what was available in nature, in, right. the, in nature's hierarchy. You know, and I often say to people, I take it further, I call that nature's principle. So nature tells us what to eat and the quantities to eat it in by how easily and when it's obtained in nature. So that which is most abundant, we're meant to have the most of. 
Mm -hmm. To obtain in nature, we're meant to have less of it. And the third group, if you cannot get it in nature, not only do we not need it, it's harmful to the body and the environment. <laughs> that's, that's what, that, that's what I tell people. People are always asking me, you know, uh, they, they say, well, let me bring all the stuff in I'm taking and um, you can tell me if it's good for me or not. And I said, here, I got a test. Can you walk in your backyard and pull that pill off a branch? <laughs> and if you can't, then freaking don't eat it. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's the. Yeah. Uh, that's that's about the the. I mean, the only the only exception we have to that rule are uh, enzymes and probiotics because we, you know, if we lived in Hawaii where we we're picking stuff off trees and eating it, we wouldn't even eat those things. Yeah. So, cool. Yeah. So, and, and then the consumption concept is is another way that helps people relate to what we're meant to be eating, based on. Uh, well, it's, it, it doesn't just relate to our food, it relates to everything. So just a very simple thing is the consumption concept is, you know, is based on what would you eat if you had to source in nature? How would you live if you had to source in nature? For most people, you know, who live in a cold climate, how big would you build your house if you had to chop down the trees, trees to, to, to fire warm it. Heat, yeah. right? Okay, um, so with food, there's an example of, mm. you know, what would you eat in a day based on what you would actually, how you would actually source this in nature. So, um, interesting. Yeah. So, an example is uh, like I would say to kids, you know, eating chocolate cake and say, who here's made chocolate cake from scratch, right? And all the hands go up, and, and you know, when you start to kind of flesh it out a little bit, I say, so from scratch, does that mean from a packet? And, you know, so I say, if you've made chocolate cake from a packet, it. That's not actually from scratch because right. there's a lot of things that go into that. Um, lots of chemicals and mm -hmm. I said, but and then a lot of people think making it from you know the flour in their kitchen, you know, and the sugar in their kitchen is from scratch. Yeah, and but if say, you had oh, to ma if you had to grow that grain and make that into it. flour, that's right. And you had to milk the cow, yeah. and then churn the butter, churn the butter to make cream, and you know separate get the everything. sugar, get the cane. Beat the juice Beat the out of it. And get right? the juice, yeah. Right? It would take you months to make that cake. <laughs> yeah, that you know, that's really interesting because when we made our uh, Fiesta Mole product, the um, the chocolate tomato product that we um, made, uh, the way that I, ba the sort of the recipe or pattern I based that on is how the, um, the uh, locals in Chiapas, which is where, you know, a majority of the, the cacao grows in Mexico, and Mexico is where cacao originated, is I, I said, well, uh, you know, if, if Chiapas is really where the majority of cacao originated, how do those people down there eat it? They don't, you know, you know, burn it and, and twist it and cook it and cook it, process it with solvents and add sugar mm -hmm. and caffeine. Most people think there's a lot of caffeine in chocolate. No, it's added. Uh, milk, sugar, no, no, no. What they do is they, they, a lot of people have like cacao bushes growing in their yards, just like a fruit tree. Yeah. And, or they go to the market and they'll buy pods and it's not what we normally think of as fermented cacao beans, although they do use those in some cases. They'll take the green beans and put them on a griddle with, uh, you know, uh, huevos, eggs in the morning or frijoles in the afternoon. And they'll just beat the cacao into pieces and mix it up with whatever they're eating. And, you know, they, they don't eat sweet chocolate there. They eat chocolate, bitter chocolate. So that's another interesting thing is if, if you had to eat um, uh, a lot of uh, one food, if you had to eat it in its natural state like chocolate, that bitter flavor naturally mediates how much you eat. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how nature works. It's fascinating. Like when I say that I often speak to, you know, groups of people and I ask them, this is kind of mainstream groups. I say, who here, if given a choice for dinner tonight of an omelet or chicken, who would choose chicken? Now, based on our consumption is, you know, uh, you know, just the pure statistics of consumption, most people would choose chicken. So in some audiences, it's up to 95% of people would choose chicken. And I say to them, given the same choice for dinner tonight, only you had to go out in the backyard and get the egg or kill cat, kill, pluck, disembowel, bleed, and prepare the chicken. I say, first of all, how many become vegetarian? Right. <laughs> Most of the hands go up, right? 
Yeah. Okay, so when you're given a choice in nature of what to eat, just based on our human tendency to find the most convenient way to do things, and that's part of our evolution. You know, it's it's not always a bad quality that we want things conveniently. Oh, so no, it's great. Part, yeah. you know, the human species, the fact that we have these computers, <laughs> you know, that we're speaking to each other is because we're not actually sourcing 100% of our food. I, I know, it's, you know, I'm in Austin and you're in Vancouver. And I've also got, you know, air conditioning here. We got electricity running these puppies. I had clean water to make my chocolate bliss out of a tap. <laughs> I mean, you know, things like toilet paper and plumbing, you know, toilets and electricity, water. I mean, these are really, really good things. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we're, we're in no, by, no way like, uh, you know, anarchists or loopy hippies that want to get back to nature and live in yurts in the, you know, on the big <laughs> island down the South Hilo. I ain't interested in that. Uh, <laughs> give me um, a culture and, a, you know, clean water and air conditioning any day and electricity and a, and a fast Internet connection. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, you know, the consumption concept is really about helping people understand well, what would you be eating if you had to source it yourself yeah. and you know how would you be living if you you know you had to source you know these things yourself and it just kind of gives a perspective viewpoint it's not it's not um by any means a dogma or you know an ideology that i i am um, you know put on people it's more just to kind of get them thinking in a way that's more natural and helping them understand what's actually going to yeah. serve them but, you know, it's interesting if you take that even um, a step farther and apply that to um, concepts of uh, how do you acquire your uh, money, which is just condensed energy. Yeah. Do you expect to, you know, commute to work and somehow sit in a cubicle and have somebody else responsible for generating income and giving you a check? Or are you going to become self-responsible and create your own checks? Yeah. Um, so a lot of that um, uh, kind of ties in with what you were talking about uh, uh, before about, you know, really uh, when it comes down to it, we're either, we, we're either externally or self-referenced, internal or external referenced. And as long as you're externally referenced where you, you know, think that, um, you know, your doctor, your uh, government, uh, uh, your physicians, government, clergy, uh, if, if you think anybody outside you knows better than you, you are in deep, deep trouble. Or are responsible. For or are you. responsible for you. There was this, um, this uh, uh, I don't know if you know who Glenn Beck is. He's, he's no, kind I'm... of a, uh, you know, one of these rabble rouser, uh, redneck newscasters uh, that talks about conspiracy theories. Um, occasionally, I used to watch his stuff years ago when he was on the t uh, television. And one day, there was... Um, um, there was some city like De Detroit or some place that was really hard hit with the, the recession here in the United States. And uh, somebody started a rumor that they were handing out money at this, uh, this like, lo I don't even know what it was. It was like an old factory or something. And they showed pictures. Somehow this rumor got started. And there was, a, there was a miles of people lined up. And so Glenn Beck sent somebody that was in the area over to interview these people. And they ask, you know, so they're handing out, you, you think they're handing out free money. Oh, yeah, 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 Obama, Obama's handing out free money today. And the question was then, well, where'd Obama get this money? I, you know, if in fact you are getting free money today, where, and you know, the, the funniest thing, which is the ultimate external reference comment that somebody made was, well, he's getting it from his stash. And, you know, and, and I and I listened to that and I thought, you know, that that really embodies the, the the really big challenge here in this country is that somehow people think that that um, resources, whether it's uh, money or health or the quality of your relationship or your your life or whatever, somehow somebody is going to manufacture some resource out in the ether someplace and give it to you. That is not the way it works. No, 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 no. So, you know, be, be self-referenced and, and take care of yourself and trust your own intuition. I think that's a big yeah. problem in our country is people um, have never developed the ability to, to go through the critical thinking process to, like, 
you know, if they walk into a grocery store, they say, well, you know, instead of just walking in and being unconscious or sleepwalking in and picking stuff off the shelf, say, you know, is this thing I've got in my hand really food? Yes. And the answer is probably not, unless you're perimeter shopping for produce. If you pick up an avocado, that by golly is a piece of food, right? And, you know, it's funny, I tell people that nutritional panels are, you know, they're really detoxification panels. Mm -hmm. you know, there's no nutritional panel on an avocado because that's real food. Fake food has nutritional panels. Yes. Um, you know, unless it's uh, something yeah. that's some requirement by, like, we're required by law to have nutritional panels on our, all our products because they've got multiple ingredients. So, but if you walk in and you, you pick up a thing of, you know, a box or bottle or bag or something off a shelf and it's got, I love these nutritional panels that are like, you know, they're like five inches tall and have like, you know, six, five or six point lettering and they've got these, le these words that are like 18 or 20 characters long i guarantee whatever that you know mumbo jumbo is on that label ain't growing out on a branch in my backyard any place mm -hmm. so anyway I, yeah. I i better stop now i'm getting wet well up. no but what you're saying is is all part of what has actually happened to basically strip us of our our intuition we have been conditioned not to trust our intuition yep. and and we've certainly uh i know you know going through nutrition uh studying nutrition at university it's a lot of a lot of that is a brainwashing to to basically say you are not a good reliable source yeah. to decide what's good for you that's back to that data thing is that, you know, yep. somebody outside, you know, something better than you and Absolutely. don't trust anybody that says that their data says that, you know, you shouldn't be eating whole foods or drinking good water, that you should be taking some, you know, pill or potion. Yep. Mm -hmm. Or packaged food. I, I yep. tell you in my work with Nutrition Australia and, and not that I'm, I just worked with them. There's many nutrition bodies. Yeah, it's all the, the same everywhere. Yes. It's just that, yes. that's so one I, example. Just pick on them. But there was this pervasive thought, and one, you know, senior p person actually told me. She said, "Sherry, people can't be trusted to make decisions for themselves." Oh. She said that, so we need to make decisions for them. Oh my lord. <laughs> and, you know, there's there's kind of the moments where you're involved and you're thinking. Well, and you know that uh, this is probably a good place to wrap up on too is um, <clears throat> to to te to know how to test the quality of advice you're getting from people. Mm -hmm. First off, is if they've <clears throat> if they've got what you desire and they're willing and able to share how they did it, that's a great source. Mm -hmm. If they think they uh, somehow you know know better than you or they're speaking from theory, like for example, my favorite is. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I go to a, a lot of networking uh, meetings here in Austin um, just to connect with new people and meet new people. And my favorite is people that are fat, sick, and nearly dead getting up and saying that they do nutritional counseling. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, dude, get, you know, if you weigh 400 pounds and have, you know, uh, odd things growing on your face, you know, go home and take care of yourself before you, you know, start, uh, a pro a, you know, proselytizing people or, you know, trying to pitch your message. And it's yeah. the same way with, um, you know, uh, doctors and government and clergy is, you know, if, if you meet a depressed preacher, you better steer clear of them, right? Because their relationship with their yeah. God ain't very, you know, intact. And so especially with a, a doctor, you know, if, if you go to a doctor with a symptom and, you know, it, here's the way you tell a, a doctor you got to work with. If the first 18 things they say are things to change in your diet and lifestyle, and then you go away and come back if you still got the symptom, that's a doctor to work with. Mm -hmm. If the first 18 ways are we, you know, we got to do tests and we got to, you know, oh my Lord, then we've got to do some, some uh, drugs and we've got to do some hack, hacking and yeah, maybe radiating and and uh, chemotherapy and that stuff out of you. Oh man, that that is not that is not a good doctor to work with. Yeah. So they can only teach what they know. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. You know, that's in in the country we say the, you know, if if all a person has is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so you got to be really careful. You know, if you'd like to hit get something cut out of you, you you take your symptom set to a um, surgeon. 
you know, if you'd like to have it drugged out of you, then you go to some sort of mainstream doctor. So, you know, you have to, you have to look at the core competencies of different people. So. Yeah. Cool. Well, anything else? Um, well, I mean, look, you know, uh, we probably could talk for days and <laughs> hours on, on end and we probably have, um, you know, um, there's this, you know, it's, it's all basically a journey. And the thing that I have most learned about the whole thing, and it sounds really corny, but it's absolutely true. It all comes down to love. You know, it really does. It's, it's about finding that spot of loving yourself. Loving the environment, you know, loving, you know, real food, loving how it makes you feel. Um, when, once you actually just kind of tie into that space, you, you find the right teachers. You find the right, you know, people who are growing things based on love of good food, nutrients on the planet. You know, if, if you use that as your litmus test and start to move in the direction, you know, people who are genuinely interested in you and the world around you, is much more powerful than people who are interested in the love of just making money. Yeah, and I would, I would, uh, you know, encourage people to find find other people whose uh, intuition is um, very well developed and they're very self referenced, and mm -hmm. just hang out with them, ask them yeah. questions. You know, find out you know how they arrange their uh, health practice and how they arrange their relationships and their work life. Because, you know, my idea of uh, appropriate work is, you know, I get up in the morning whenever I like and you walk, you know, it's about 10 feet from where I sleep to where I work. That's my idea of morning commute. <laughs> yes, same here. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So I, yeah. So I have, I'm just in the process of moving, David. So I'm moving into East Vancouver to start the Holistic Culinary Academy. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, so let's wrap up and just uh, tell a little bit about that project that you're working on. Well, the reason that you jogged my mind, uh, my memory, is that I have lived and worked from home since 1993. And uh, so oh. I'm now making this move, and I'm really excited about it. So I'm taking people who are really interested in holistic you know, living, holistic nutrition, and bringing them into the school to teach them how to prepare foods, you know, foods that will actually hyper-nourish them. Mm -hmm. And also to teach people how to teach other people and create a business model so that they can actually make a living. You know, we've got a lot of work to do to clean up the lethal recipe from people's diets. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, so that's what I'm doing. It's um, going to be in East Vancouver. I'm doing a lot of, I will be creating a lot of content online. Cool that and, and um yeah so i'm really excited about that that's where i'm where I'm, my next commute is from. awesome and so if yeah. people uh drop you an email to sherry at sherrystrong.com then you can keep them up to date with your absolutely uh, activities and yeah. I, i'm telling you you gotta start a meetup group girl that'll uh, that'll help you out on your um, um i will david working with your uh, uh clients on a um a regular basis I will. You you are the master of meetup, and I really need to. For some reason, you know, there's a bit of a disconnect in my brain. I'm not not quite getting it, so I need to get more of your your knowledge. Cool. <laughs> awesome. Well, it was great talking with you today, and I'm I'm sure we'll um, we'll talk again soon. Great. Thanks, David. Take See care. You.